Good evening. We are front, we're recording in the church office. The internet was not working, and we kept unplugging it, plugging it back in, and I think it might be working again, but we promised you we would be 30 minutes late, so we're recording now. Uh, and uh, so thank you. Um, I got Jeff to come because last year I last week I talked for a solid hour. And, uh, and I talked to myself for a solid hour. It was sort of depressing. <laughs> uh, I'm not a high-tech person at all. I'd like to go over our prayer concerns. Let's remember Anthony Pounds, Patricia Porter, Kyle, I think Kyle Palmer as well now, Denise Fike, the Jimmy Mayfield family, Cheryl McNeil, Callie Kreitz, uh, Richard Wilson, Colby Stidham, Deborah Loggins, Billy Young, Linda Frank, and also in the death of her father, J.D. Watts. Donald Ray Thomas is supposed to come off of the quarantine on Friday, so we're thankful for that. Myra and Mickey Collin, Johnny Jones, Amelia Sierra, our local tornado victims, our Tennessee and Alabama and Georgia victims. I'm not sure if there are any in Mississippi or not. COVID-19 victims, uh, Burnell Francis and, and Lee Berry. Uh, Lee uh, fell on Saturday and, and cracked a vertebrae in his back and he will go see a specialist next week. So uh, let's go to God in prayer. Gracious God, we're thankful to lift these concerns before you. We ask that you would bring your healing touch to each one. We pray for your healing touch upon our country as we battle with this COVID-19 virus. We pray, Father, for there are all kinds of things that people are getting sick with, but this virus is uh, taking precedent over everything else. We pray, Father, for our folks who are not able to work. We pray that they're gonna be able to survive this economic crisis brought on by this virus. Uh, we pray for our church, that we too will be able to survive it. We pray for people out in the community that have to be out, uh, that they will not be sick, that they'll be able to avoid the virus. And uh, Father, that your hand of grace and mercy will be upon us. We pray, Lord, that you would guide us in our Bible study tonight in Hebrews and that you will speak mightily to us. Father, we thank you for your love and mercy and we humbly lift ourselves to you in Christ's holy name. Amen. Now, there's been some question. We are going to put the cross out. It will be on the at the front of the church up at the top of the steps on Easter Sunday morning. We ask you to practice safe distancing if somebody's already up there please don't go up there wait till they are down and uh, and and are back to their car so that we don't have people getting too close to each other and uh, so i think that'll take care of that and um there's no activity scheduled at the church amazingly <laughs> we're, we need to do some things on zoom and we're going to check that out and do the best that we can so uh we're in hebrews chapter one we're going to look at verses 5 through 14. I'm going to read them and then we'll come back to them uh, as we go through. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his servants flames of fire. But of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the righteous scepter is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And in the beginning, Lord, you founded the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like clothing. Like a cloak, you will roll them up, and like clothing, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will never end. But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are not all angels spirits in the divine service sent to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? All right, so let's remember from last week, the Hebrews are tired. Yeah, we are too, aren't we? They're doubting, uh, even doubting Jesus. Uh, and, and actually, that's two weeks ago, but I'm talking about then. So remember, God, uh, he describes God, or the preacher describes God as speaking to us through his son. After making purification for our sins, he raised Jesus from the dead, and Jesus sits at God's right hand. 
What angel can measure up to that? Of course, that's a rhetorical question, not one. So in verse 5, For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son? The implied answer is never. He's never said anything like that to an angel. The quotation is from Psalm chapter 2, verse 7. I will tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Now in the historical context, this is what was said to the king at the kingly coronations. But to the early church, by the time the Hebrews were written, they already applied this passage to Jesus' baptism and especially to his resurrection. Acts chapter 13, verse 33 reads, He has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising Jesus, as also it is written in the second psalm, You are my son, today I have begotten you. So the preacher is saying, you know, God raised his son from the dead. Ever hear him doing anything like that for any angel? No, have not. A second sonship quotation is added for emphasis. I will be his father and he will be my son, which is taken from 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 14. I'll be a father to him and he will be like a son to me. Once more, it isn't the historical context. This one was with David but it's the early church's understanding to point to the spiritual family relationship between God and Christian believers and also between God and Jesus and their bond. So moving to verse six, let all the angels worship Jesus. We are sure if uh, that's it at Jesus' birth, excuse me, we're not sure whether that's at Jesus' birth or whether it's at his ascension, or perhaps when he comes again at the parousia. This is the point. Angels worship Jesus. They bow down to Jesus. Verse 7 refers to Psalm 104, verse 4. But it's not from the Hebrew version. It's from the Greek version, and that version, version is called the Septuagint. Boy, don't you just love those big words like that, the Septuagint. It reverses the order and implies that the angels are like winds and flame. They blow and burn, but they're transitory. Verses 8 and 9 contrast with verse 8, which says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And this is one of the few places in the Bible where Jesus is called God. Verses 10 to 12, once more we talk about Jesus being present at the beginning when the earth was formed. Earth and heaven, we are the work of your hands. Other things perish, but the Lord lasts forever. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, last week, I happened to watch the news, and on that particular day, 300 people in New York City died uh, in one day. They've had days much worse than that now. They were placed in makeshift morgues. In other words, they were put in trucks with uh, uh, freezer units on them. And uh, they're trying to create makeshift morgues all over New York City and in other places in our country. I heard one news broadcaster say that they were even considering renting a, uh, a, a warehouse that had freezer system in the whole warehouse. They were anticipating that many bodies. Mm -hmm. I also read that FEMA was asking the military for 100,000 body bags. Just kind of put that in perspective. Because of this horrible virus, these people's time on earth is completed. But if they know Jesus, they're going to be with Jesus forever. He is forever. His years will never, ever end. Then in verses 13 and 14, the preacher quotes Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. Hebrews would recognize this passage immediately since it was a favorite in the early church. This passage is also in Mark, it's in Acts, it's in Ephesians, it's in Hebrews chapter 10, it's in 1 Peter. The work of Jesus' redemption is done. Jesus has triumphed over evil and death on the cross. Angels are in divine service sent to help those who are to inherit salvation. So what's going on? Is there some problem with angel worship in the church? No, that's not the problem. Apparently the Hebrews were in distress. 
And as a consequence, they were having trouble holding on to their faith. They were weary. They were disheartened. They were exhausted. And all they could see was trouble. Ooh, sounds familiar, doesn't it? Jesus appeared to be of little help. He was beaten. He was bloodied. He was humiliated. He was mocked. He was shouting in pain from the cross from which he seemed unable to save himself, much less anyone else. Their problem was that Jesus seemed to them to be too human, too vulnerable. He appeared to be less than God and a lot lower than the angels. They were tired of being Christians. They were tired of Jesus. The response of the preacher was not to pretend that their experiences were not painful or that their vision was blurred. He doesn't say, look here, things will be better. They're not so bad. He doesn't say, count your blessings. He knows that they're suffering and that their suffering is authentic and that the threats to them are real. What he does is to preach the truth of the gospel that lies beyond sight and beyond touch. The deepest and most trust trustworthy reality can't be seen with the naked eye. It can only be heard with the heart of faith. The preacher is counting on the congregation's ability to pay more attention to the things heard but not seen. They must hold fast to what is confessed by the mouth study the oracles of God, and trust that God has now spoken by a son. Jesus was beaten and bloodied, but now he's seated at God's right hand in power and authority. I mentioned the parabola of salvation. That's, here's the parabola. Jesus, Jesus starts in heaven, and then he comes down lower than the angels as he, be, as he comes to earth as a human, and then, after the resurrection, he goes back up into heaven where he's seated at the right hand of God. So it goes dippity-doo and up you go, right? I'm sure um, that Dr. Long, whose commentary I'm using, uh, would really love that dippity-doo phrase. <laughs> so... That's a great start for us in the face of this pandemic in our country and around the world. We're predicting, ooh, 180, 220,000 people dead. I think that number has gone up. The frontline people, the EMTs, the police, healthcare workers, doctors, nurses, they're the ones on the front line. And if they go down and we don't have enough medical personnel to take care of people, guess what? The numbers are going to go up. How do you explain to your child that the nurse, either your mother or your father, has died from the same thing that they were trying to protect others from? We see this tragedy unfolding. We hear stories of people with COVID-19 trying to get tested and being turned down. A choir practice had 45 people in it catch this virus. A funeral infected many uh, and who were there to mourn their loss. I think there's a place in Albany, Georgia, or Albany, Georgia had a, a person with the COVID virus go to a funeral and all those people took it home. This community is an older community. It's not a very wealthy community. Nearly everybody in the town has COVID-19. There's not enough medical personnel to take care of them. There's not enough hospital beds. Other awful things are happening. People still have wrecks. Tornadoes are still going through. High winds are destroying homes, businesses, and lives. People are dying of cancer. We still have heart attacks, kidney failure, and bowel abscesses. People are not robbing as much as they were before, but they're scamming on the phone and, and fishing on your computer, that's spelled P-H-I-S-H-I-N-G, or on your mobile device. We know about the shame and humility that Jesus faced on the cross. Where is the victory? Right here, the preacher declares. Jesus met these things as he slipped from heaven to earth 
and after atoning for our sin and taking upon himself our hurt, he ascended in victory to heaven where he is more glorious than the angels. The preacher says Jesus is relevant for our time. He's not just a person who died a shameful, bloody, horrible death. He's victorious over all. And through him, we can be victorious too. Jesus will be with us as we face this COVID-19 outbreak. All right, let's look at chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Our computer is making noise over here. Uh, that one? No, the one in the office here. I'm sorry. It started making these noises uh, the other day. So if you hear all this little dinging, that's our computer. Oh. All right, so I'm going to read verses one, chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Therefore, we must pay greater attention to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away from it. For if the message declared through angels was valid, and every transgression or disobedience received a just penalty, how can we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first through the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard him, while God added his testimony by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his word. So in the middle of singing this hymn of praise about the Lord, the preacher interrupts everything with an ethics class. He challenges the Hebrews, and he challenges us to be attentive, to be steadfast, alert, and obedient to the faith. He's asking them to take stock of their own lives, which is what we've been doing all during Lent, and avoid the danger of drifting away under pressure from the world. This section is not a detour. It's like a flashing yellow caution light. The sermon will soon take Jesus by the hand and go down the path of Jesus' anguish and vulnerability. This time of year, we sing, Tell Me the Stories of Jesus. I love to hear, but in their tired and worn out state, do they really want to hear that? I mean, we sang that last Sunday. The story's dangerous because the earthly Jesus died and he seems to go against the powers that be and he loses. Like so many others before them, he tried to buck those apparent, those powers and apparently lost. The Jewish leaders hated him and they convinced the power of Rome to crucify him. Pilate knew Jesus was innocent, but he sentenced him to death because that was the expedient thing to do to keep the Jews satisfied. Life is difficult. Jesus came into that difficulty and it doesn't take long to remember sadness over a wayward child, sadness over an abandoned spouse, where to find food for the next day. You remember, most of the world lives on $2 a day, and there's another subgroup that is, just lives on $1 a day. Then there are people coping with a disability, or there are people who are standing looking in the grave, and those numbers are adding up quickly here in the United States. We live below heaven on this earth, but the preacher cannot and will not skip the cross. Yet, as Jesus went to the cross, what we can see and what we can hear is not crucial. What's crucial is that our vision is by eyes of faith and that we can see and hear that Jesus is now the victorious one. We need the hope of victory, the promise of eternal life. Therefore, we pray greater attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. I think Paul Simon sang a song, Slip Sliding Away. We don't want to do that. We want to maintain our faith. So in verses 2 through 4, the preacher paints a courtroom. That's pretty cool, isn't it? He wants people to take a, a, a faithful look, but he can't just say, behave yourself. 
Being pious won't work. God wants you to behave yourself. The problem lies in the will. Okay? You can say, I mean, preachers, people, parents say that kind of stuff all day long. But you have to want to do God's will. The trials of life have whittled away their confidence and frightened and fatigued them in their faith. They know the gospel. They just don't trust the gospel. So a good defense lawyer files an appeal. The message, remember, how the sermon started, long ago God spoke to our ancestors. That same message that even angels declared was valid. A legal term still applies. How do we know this? Well, every transgression or disobedience received a just penalty. How long did the Israelites wander in the desert for not being faithful to God? Forty years. How long were the Israelites in Babylonian captivity for not being faithful to God, refusing to listen to prophet after prophet after prophet? Seventy years. How uh, Now this penalty was not like some electric fence that if you walked into, it, it shocked you and, you and you jumped back. It's rather that God's law it's like parental wisdom to children that makes life good and whole. When children follow that wisdom, then their lives are full of joy. And when they do not, then their foolishness carries the consequence of pain and tragedy. So if the law was valid and true, how much more is this new law, the new life in Christ, the message of salvation, valid and true, and not to be neglected. Verse 3 says, How can we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? It was declared at first through the Lord and was attested to us by those who heard him. <clears throat> so the preacher calls Jesus to the defense stand. Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, and what he taught is not merely about the work of God, it was the living and active word having authority beyond other teachers. Matthew chapter 7, verse 29 says, For he taught them as one having authority and not as their scribes. What Jesus said is corroborated by those who first heard him, his disciples, and then by other learners. And then we add the crowning point of the defense, the crowning point none other than the Lord God himself. The lawyers say the best for last. God's witnesses with all the signs and wonders like healing, turning water into wine, casting out, um, casting out demons, controlling wind and waves, etc. But he's also talking about a way of life in which the Holy Spirit is active in the life of the Christian, bringing about forgiveness, bringing about teaching, healing, discernment, and wisdom. It's a function of the Holy Spirit. We can see the active presence of the whole presence of the Holy Spirit working in us and in the world around us. Okay, that's really strange. I mean, I would be stopping and asking. If people have questions and having comments and all that, but you can't ask, and I'm just going to keep going along. So we're in verses 5 through 8. Now, God did not subject the coming world about which we are speaking to angels, but someone has testified somewhere, what are human beings that you're mindful of them, or mortals that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels. You have crowned them with glory and honor, subjecting all things under their feet. Now in subjecting all things to them, God has left nothing outside their control. As it is, we do not see everything in subjection to them. And that stops right there. But we do see Jesus going into verse 9. So this is a shift from higher uh, uh, than the angels to lower than the angels. He changes, if you were doing music, he would change from a, major key to a minor key and he uses psalm verses chapter 8 
as the means to accomplish this task. Now the preacher uses the psalm like he wants to, twisting it to fit his purpose. I can't believe preachers do that. Can, can you believe it? We take a story and we use it for how we want it, not necessarily how it was intended. I, I know a bishop who even did that uh, in, a, in a book and, and when he twisted the story around, the grandparents of the child who, uh, who he changed the story about uh, read the book and called him on it. It was pretty funny. But anyway, um, uh, the psalmist uh, uh, finds that the preacher has twisted uh, kind of what he said. He says that the subjection of the world to come happens only after the Son, Jesus, is made lower than the angels. That means he had to fully participate in the human condition. The congregation had a hard time. He's been superior to angels, a reflection of God's glory. Why did he walk the tragic road of human loss to defeat and to death? If he was above everything, why did he submit himself to shame, the shame of a cross? The way the preacher uses Psalm 8 answers that for us. Now, in the Old Testament, Psalm 8 is about humanity in general. Why would the Lord of all creation treat lowly humans with such dignity? It's one of my favorite psalms. The preacher takes this psalm about all people, and he makes it about one. He makes it about Jesus. In the Greek, the text says, The Son of Man, that you are mindful of him. The preacher focuses on the Son of Man motif. Now, the New Revised Standard Version that I read for takes all that man imagery out and tries to make it even for everybody else, but it makes a lot more sense if you read it with the word man in there. The preacher skips a line where God gave people dominion over the earth. He doesn't want us to get confused. And he reverses the point about how magnificent human beings are to one about how low the exalted son was willing to stoop to join himself to our lowly human condition. When my son was a student uh, at Birmingham Southern College, the president of the college at that time, General Krulak, <clears throat> would help the students unpack their cars. Now, General Krulak had an audience with the president of the United States. He what had been the Marine Commandant, and here he was unloading cars. I mean, when they were trying to decide whether to do the raid on Osama bin Laden, they called General Krulak in on making that decision. And yet here this man is helping freshman students unpack their vehicles and take their stuff to the dorm room. Verse 7 says, You have made him for a little while lower than the angels. This means for a measure of time, Jesus was fully immersed in our world. He was, in, he was one of us. So let's look at the second part of chapter, of, of, of chapter 2, verse 8. So we'll look at 8b and do verse 9. As it is, we do not yet see everything in subjection to them, but we do see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. The preacher makes a turning point here. He's been talking about Jesus going down to earth and making the point of the cross. And he says, we do see, and then he pauses. This is like a preaching thing. We do see, we do see, we do see. What we see is Jesus. We can see Jesus going to the cross but we have to hear about Jesus going into heaven. We can see the whip on his back, but we have to hear that he's seated at God's right hand. An African-American preacher, I used this in my sermon last Sunday, had a sermon. He preached for two solid hours. And in that sermon, his catchphrase was, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. It's Friday. But Sunday's coming. Jesus is crowned with glory because he was willing to take the suffering and death. He did it for everyone. He did not do it for himself. 
All right, so let's look at chapter 2, verses 10 through 18. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, in bringing many children to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here I am and the children whom God has given me. Since therefore the children share flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared the same things, so that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by uh, the fear of death. For it's clear that he did not come to help angels, but the descendants of Abraham. Therefore he had to become like his brothers and sisters in every respect, so that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make a sacrifice of atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself was tested by what he suffered, he is able to help those who are being tested. That's me and you. So how does Jesus taste death for everyone? How does his passion connect to all of humanity? That's what the preacher is going to talk about. He's going to talk about him as a hero. He descends to the world to defeat the powers of death and to rescue those who are trapped in death's grip. Then he describes him as a liberator, like the Allied troops who liberated the, the prisoners of war who were at Auschwitz, Dachau, and other concentration camps. Jesus broke through the gates of hell and death and destroyed the commander of death, the devil, and liberated those who were imprisoned in fear. And then he, he, be, he will be the high priest, the merciful and faithful high priest who made an atonement of sacrifice for the sins of the people. So let's look at verse 10. The word fitting. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, and bringing many children to glory, should make a pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Now the word fitting is very interesting. It's a phrase of etiquette and civility. Something like mismanners deeming that the silverware is appropriately placed on the table. How in the world could a Greek-speaking Hellenistic people call it fitting the notion of God being roughed up, sweltering in human pain? It doesn't fit. It doesn't fit that the one through whom all things came into existence, gets bullied by a weak and vacillating Roman puppet and sent up to Golgotha like a criminal in a brutal execution. I have a little quote I want to share with you. Any notion of God partaking of human suffering is inconceivable, sheer foolishness, hardly fitting. Only in the light of the gospel narrative only in the context of the story of the incarnation, that's Jesus becoming human, does the unthinkable become necessary, the unimaginable become that which is fitting, the incongruous become indispensable, and the foolishness of the incarnate Son, crucified, dead, and buried, become the very wisdom of God. Can you believe that? How in the world could Jesus become those things for us. How could he do that? He was willing to suffer on our behalf. So Jesus was without sin. The idea of perfect here is not questioning whether Jesus was a sinless person. The idea of perfect here is like when a machinist is making a part and when he has cut it out and then sanded it down and honed it, and then he puts that part into uh, the, the equipment that it's supposed to be on and it slides in and it fits just perfectly, that's what we're talking about. Jesus was perfectly obedient to the, to the Father. It's through suffering that Jesus was shaped and fashioned 
to perform the task of redemption. So just like that part fitting in, Jesus fits in perfectly to be able to provide the redemption for us. I wonder if we're being shaped and fashioned by this COVID-19 virus. God tests us with trials. We know that. The issue then is one of, of obedience. There are many Christians, many more Christians than any other religion on the face of the earth. Jesus was perfectly obedient to God, willing to die in his obedience. Now, Job is represented in the Bible as a faithful man to God. You can think of Jesus as the new Job. Jesus' suffering joins him perfectly and completely to the human condition, the human situation we find ourselves in. Through his pain, Jesus became a brother to us all. Let me share another quote with you. The preacher is saying that when the gaze of the eternal Son of God encompasses a criminal on death row, when the glorified Son sees a homeless woman crawling into a cardboard box to keep from freezing to death at night, when the Lord of all sees a man robbed of dignity and purpose by schizophrenia, when the divine heir of all things sees a mother weeping over the death of her child or a man battling the last savage assault of cancer or the swollen body of a child slowly starving to death, he doesn't see a charity case, a pitiful victim, or a hopeless cause. What he sees is a brother. He sees a sister, and he's not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. Instead, he says, there, because of the grace of God, I am. And as the psalmist puts it, the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. He knows how we were made, and he remembers that we are dust. By virtue of his suffering, Jesus offers compassion to us all. Then, um, that's verse 10. Now, in 11 through 18, we all have one Father. Jesus sanctifies those, and those who are sanctified share in that same Father. Next, the preacher shares three Old Testament texts. But instead of just quoting them, he wants you to kind of see Jesus speaking them. The first one is from Psalm 22, 22. I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. It still has Jesus in heaven before he leaves heaven. That's where he is. This is what he's going to do when he comes to earth. The second quote is probably based on Isaiah chapter 18, verse 17, which says, I will wait for the Lord who is hiding his face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope in him. So he's saying that once he gets to the earth, Jesus trusts God that even in the midst of persecution on earth, he will continue to rely on God so that he can fully represent humans before God. It represents his time on earth. So we, we started in heaven. Now the second quote, he's on earth. And then the third quote is also taken from Isaiah chapter 8. It's the next verse, verse 18. See, I and the children whom the Lord has given me are signs and portents in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells on Mount Zion. In this passage then, Jesus has returned to heaven. Jesus is now seated at the right hand of God, victorious over creation. Because Jesus toiled on earth, his brothers and sisters now have a place in heaven. Can you see the first responders flying down the road, going to a COVID-19 case, trying to save the person's life, knowing that their own lives might be on the line? They don't turn back in fear. They don't throw up their hands in despair. They do their jobs. That's what Jesus did. Because Jesus did that for us, we can have hope. We can complete our mission on this earth. Next, the preacher focuses on the second quote. I will put my trust in him. What exactly was Jesus doing when he cried out his confession? I will put my trust in him. Jesus was becoming a slave so he could smuggle himself into a slave camp. Huh? <laughs> let, let me share with you what that means. 
As a slave, Jesus refused. Wait a minute. No, I'm doing the wrong one. Here we see the image of Jesus as the liberator, the one who breaks into the slave quarters and sets the slaves free. The preacher pictures all humanity as slaves and the devil as the heartless slave master. Every slave master has a whip, a means of power and fear and control, and the devil's whip is death. All human beings are being held in slavery by the fear of death. That's verse 215. And free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. And then, as a slave, Jesus refused to obey the slave master. Instead, he obeyed the one who sent him and trusted God to keep the promise. He knew, of course, that his defiance would force the demonic slave driver to apply the whip of death, which he did. But the Son of Man became a slave, never wavered. I will put my trust in him, he said, Father, into your hand. I commend my spirit. He prayed, even as the last lash fell upon his back. <clears throat> Jesus came to help the children of Abraham. He didn't come to help the angels. Angels aren't forced to work in the fields under the lash of death, but we are. So Jesus came to save us. When asked about his credentials, Jesus shows his scars as a sign of his mercy and faith. Now, Jeff's going to have to hurry to get home, so I'm going to tell, tell you a quick story here. I'm going to cut it down a little bit. There's a story that took place in England. There was a man who started preaching uh, and saying that he was Jesus returned in the flesh. He claimed that he could heal people, that he could restore sight to the blind, that he could make the lame walk. He claimed to be able to do all those things. And he gathered gathered quite a big following. So one day this man is preaching and in the distance you can hear the Salvation Army band coming. And he gets louder and louder as it gets closer and closer. And they walked right into that building and right up in the middle of everybody until the captain stood right in front of the man who claimed to be Jesus. And he said, Are you the Christ? Tell us plainly. Yes, said the speaker. I am Christ returned to earth. And the captain said, Very well, show us your hands. There's no nail scars in those hands, people. He ain't the Christ. Because our Savior has nail scars in his hands. And as soon as the captain said that, the, began, the band began to play. I shall know him. I shall know him by the print of the nails in his hands. Jesus bears the scars of the cross, scars of human suffering and death, and he was tested by what he suffered. For all of us must still face suffering. All of us must trudge, trudge uh, to the cemetery in sorrow, but we are not without comfort and help. For the great high priest who sits on the throne of glory has been there too. He bears the scars of his testing. And he is able to help those who are being tested. Let's pray. Gracious God, help us not to grow weary. Even in the midst of all the different things happening because of this virus, Lord, may we not grow weary. May we keep our eyes, even as the preacher asked his Hebrew people to look beyond the things of earth and into heaven where Jesus is seated at the right hand. Father, may we do that too. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now I'm going to do a Monday Thursday service tomorrow at 6, and I'll invite you to celebrate Holy Communion in your home. If you have some grape juice and some bread or crackers, you can do that. If you have wine, I'm sure that wine would just be for cooking prep purposes, then you could use wine if you didn't have grape juice. Whiskey is not allowed. I'm sorry, it is not from a grape. It's from corn squeezing, okay? And if you don't have any grape juice and you don't have any wine, just use the bread. When I go to annual conference and there's a million, jillion people dipping their fingers in that cup, uh, I just take the bread and eat it and walk on by. 
They did that all during the Middle Ages. The, uh, the bread would be just fine. So at the end of the meditation that I'll do tomorrow night at 6, then we will um, we'll celebrate Holy Communion over the airwaves. And finally, on Good Friday, I will do a Good Friday meditation at 3 o'clock at the time that Jesus died on the cross. God bless. Good night.